Welcome to a virtual show. But he said that I messed up on camera. You're in a virtual experience. It's a part of the educator VR and virtual world society. And they are bringing together experts and innovators in immersive education, literally disrupting education around the world. So today we have an exciting panel um, uh, set for you. The conversation will be thinking with history in XR. We're so excited. Just before that, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge and thank sponsors. This is a 30 day 19 platform conference. It does not happen without a lot of those. Um, it's about 170 events does not happen yeah, without a... the um, uh, help of sponsors. And so we are thrilled that our infinity sponsor is HP virtual reality and HP. Um, and HP. Just, um, we'll just take care of this right now. Okay, and HP Higher Education. We are, they just released a new version of the HP Reverb G2. It is perfectly designed for higher ed with pulse and eye monitoring and testing and other innovations, excellent for precision controls, research and development. Check out the articles on your on the website for educatorsinvr.com. You can also head to hp.com and check for HP Virtual Reality and HP Higher Education. I also want to take a moment just to mention Engage VR. We have had so many events over at Engage, and I hope you've been taking the opportunity to um, visit that platform. There's still more events to come, so please check the calendar. And Advantage Education is sponsoring the Euphoria Nightclub, and we still have some social events coming up, so please check the calendar. You uh, don't want to miss that as well. So thanks to those sponsors. And now, without further ado, I'm going to pass the mic over to Paula. And Paula, you can get your panel discussion started. Thank you. Well, thank you, Donna, and good afternoon, good evening, good morning to all our guests here today. Thanks for joining our gathering. We are really excited to, to be here today and um, to share with you uh, some really interesting discussion around the value of thinking with history. We we're going to examine some new immersive possibilities for teaching history through engagement with digital recreations of past landscapes, events, and narratives, so that we will have time for your questions, and we'd really love to hear your thoughts and opinions. Um, we will begin with our own panel discussion just to get things started. and. I want to invite our panel to, first of all, just quickly give a brief introduction to who they are so you can get to know us a little bit better. And we'll just go in order. So, Jay, do you want to introduce yourself? I'll do my best and I'll try this amplify my voice thing. Yeah, I'm Dr. Jay Wilson. I'm a professor in the Department of Curriculum Studies in the College of Education at the University of Saskatchewan, and I'm also uh, a former historian and graduate of the history department. So I have uh, lots of connections and lots of interest in the particular project that we're going to talk about today. Excellent. And next up, Atif. Great. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, uh, my name's Atif Ghani. I'm a co-founder of a company called Heritage 5G, and I am an immersive producer. Um, I'm also a sociologist by background, but I previously was working very much in uh, feature films and in linear and flat media prior. In the last sort of three years, I've been working much more in sort of the immersive space. And a couple of years ago, I guess now, I kind of ran into Jim's book, who will introduce himself. And we have sort of started on this project of trying to visualize um, East London, in particular, the sort of Olympic Park area. In, in, in a sort of different kind of way. So yeah, really looking forward to the session. Thank you everyone for all the organizing. Really looking forward to it. Great, next is Alex. 
Hi everyone, my name is Alex Green. I'm a historian at the University of Essex in the UK. Um, I'm someone who's just really interested in the value of history for navigating the present really and kind of making sense of this world. Um, I first really got into it through having a first career in government and policy and just feeling that the one thing that was really missing from a lot of the decision making discussions was a sense of history. So that's how I got into it. And I've been kind of playing with those ideas about what it means to think with history ever since. So I'm really excited to be here. Thanks, Alex. Next up, we have Jim. OK, sorry, G figuring out the technology Perfect. here. Hi, so I'm Jim Clifford. I am at the University of Saskatchewan in the Department of History. I'm a historian of East London uh, with a focus on environmental and social change in the 19th century and how that connects to uh, globalization in the 19th century. But I've also had a long interest in figuring out how we can better communicate uh, the research that's done in, in academic history departments to the broader public uh, that started out with uh, a blogging project uh, a little over a decade now. And I'm just interested in, in the many different ways that we can kind of continue to use digital tools to reach a wider audience and, and to get people not just thinking that history is important, but to consider how uh, history can help us think about our present and future challenges, which we're all now very aware are, are kind of very pressing at this time in history. Thanks, Jim. And last, we have Ben. Hi, everyone. My name is Benjamin Hoy. I'm an associate professor of history at the University of Saskatchewan. Um, like Jim, I'm, I'm very interested in how you translate history into mediums other than the tech, other than text. And so a lot of my early work is focused on analog games, uh, board games, tabletop games, things like that, as a way of creating an interactive experience where people can learn and think about history. Thanks, Ben. And before that's our panel, everybody. And before we begin, just another quick, um, some more love and emojis for the entire educators and VR team and Laurel, Donna and Daniel and uh, and everyone for nine hours today of events. Um, this amazing Univirtual experience. We're so excited to be part of it. And and also thanks to the legendary Tony from Tony Cube Studios for filming and Ryan Bano for helping us with moderation. To begin our panel, I'm going to invite Jim to ask Alex to explain a little bit more about what does it mean to think with history? So thank you very much, Alex, for joining us. Alex and I uh, corresponded oh, probably the better part of a decade ago. I haven't <laughs> been in touch in a while, but I, I returned to an article she published in 2013 that I thought was really uh, prescient and, and important for the year that we've all just lived through. And uh, so I'm going to ask her to talk about this concept of thinking with history, in particular, how thinking with history is an important kind of addition to the uh, model-driven statistical way that we often think about the world in the media and in governments and business circles. So just think of the past year where daily we've been paying attention to the numbers, to the case counts, to the new models predicting how the latest variant of concern is going to increase uh, the spread of virus, uh, what that's going to do to our GDP, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's very familiar to us in this moment and just how much statistical thinking, big data models uh, shape uh, our response to the world and, and how maybe that isn't enough and the historical thinking can, can add to that. So Alex, why do we need history in, in a moment where, where models are so powerful and in some ways quite effective? Thanks, Jim. And it is so great to be back in touch with you. I'd forgotten that it was quite so many years since we first corresponded. So 
thank you for inviting me back. Um, I think there's a couple of things we need to think about. I think the first is that what do we mean by history when we're saying thinking with history? And I think the last few months, certainly in the UK, has shown that people often have two different things in mind. So I think when politicians, particularly from the right of the political spectrum, talk about history, what they mean is something that's quite inert, that's um, literally made of stone in many all the controversies to do with uh, the statues of uh, former slave owners and slave traders, for example. Whereas I think when we're talking about history, we're talking about a kind of set of skills or mental habits or cognitive moves, to borrow um, uh, Sam Weinberg's term. So I think we need to think with history because it draws attention to the fact these are thinking processes and not just inert stuff, not the past as if it's just one kind of static thing. So that's what we mean when we talk about thinking with history set of skills or moves I think are really important in terms of um, understanding the past and how the past connects with the with the present um, and I think the second thing I'd say is, is why is it important now well it's important now because um, this is a something you know this is a inescapably human moment and numbers will never give us kind of purchase on that Numbers alone will never be enough. And I think what history gives us is a sense of human connection, of human experience. And without that, I think it's very difficult to navigate a crisis, let alone recover from one. So it's about restoring the kind of humanity, the empathy that I think history gives us. So that will kind of be my opening gambit is we need history as a set of skills rather than just recovering a kind of inert, fixed body of knowledge. And we need to recapture that kind of human connection. I think history does that in a in a unique way that's kind of sensitive to context, um, to differences in kind of culture and position. Um, and that's often sadly lacking. I think numbers aggregate at a level that is quite difficult for us to connect to at that that immediate human level. Thanks a lot, Alex. So I'll uh, expand on that question. And I'll invite Ben if he wants to join this conversation to do so. Uh, one thing you really emphasize in the article is the importance of narrative uh, in sort of putting a, a current problem or a current and future problem into a, a context that has a past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. Why is that very basic thing that is so much a part of what historians do uh, important uh, when you are doing work with? Uh, leaders at universities and in the business sector, why is getting them to kind of think in a narrative structure uh, an important uh, addition to, to the kind of thinking that they are generally doing? Yeah, I mean, I I think um, gets them to think, if we think about the backward glance, looking backward in time, it gives them a sense of the connections and the deep roots of the situation which they're facing. Um, it can be very tempting to kind of share yourself from those roots. Um, for example, to not take responsibility. Um, you know, that, that wasn't my doing. Um, or to not recognize um, the way in which those roots help you understand the problem. Um, so I think it's important to understand those roots so we can understand, we can get, we have a framework within which to look at the current moment. And looking forward in time in kind of the other direction, um, I think it gives a sense of responsibility. I kind of would follow the kind of Neustadt and May argument here that just as those former leaders are our past, we will be the past for future leaders. And that gives us a sense of responsibility, I think, towards the future to conduct ourselves with fix um, and um, responsibility so I think both the backward glance and the forward glance are really important and it, you kind of set yourself your what they call I guess the decision making moment in that long stream of time it kind of embeds you if you like within um, a, a long story of 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 experience and um, I think it certainly their line would be that it it tries to prevent you plunging towards action. You know, I must take action. I must act, you know, now and decisively. Whereas if once you see yourself in that longer 
narrative, that longer stream of time, you get a sense that actually, no, there's more information, there's more context, there's more that I, um, considerations that I have to take on board. Um, and hopefully that makes for a kind of better decision making, more informed decision making, more careful, more ethical decision making as well. So the narrative embeds you, I think, in something bigger, and that's a really important consideration. And building off your idea, uh, building off your idea of narrative, Jim. I think at the core we're storytelling creatures. You, know, you think about the things how we train our children. It's, it's with stories, right? Story time. You know, if you think about the major issues that politicians are concerned about, it's textbooks. It's the stories we're telling young adults. And so I think controlling and learning how to sort of pitch these stories in a, in a way that the public can understand is fundamental if we're interested in making social change. You know, statistics, um, you know, for all of their power, fly over the head of, of many, uh, many people in our world. But, but history, I think, is one of the really interesting disciplines where the highest level of history is written in a format, a, a story, that many people in the public can understand. And I think by, by moving this into VR, or AR, or XR, you know, we're, we're extending our reach in, in a really interesting way. And I, I think it's, it's got to be a story of some kind. Uh, because that's that's in many ways a universal language that crosses political spectrums, it crosses age groups, it crosses demography in, in really interesting and powerful ways. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Yeah, that that thank you for that um that response, Ben. And so thinking about what Alex has said on, on the value of thinking with history and being able to have this back. The larger narrative. Um, so, you know, we can see the value. And the question here is, you know, how, how do we do it um, for you know, how do we engage the general public who might not be learning about history from textbooks and from journal articles? So how do we actually engage the public and, and also engage learners across the lifespan in thinking with history, in, in learning about history education? And in, in particular, like, you know, what modes of communication are most effective? Um, you know, beyond PowerPoint slides or, um, you know, just the different modes of communication that we have. Uh, maybe a thief, maybe you'd like to speak to this in terms of like what some of the new visualization tools that we have and how can they actually um, contribute or what are the affordances and constraints for for learning about history i mean uh, well again paula thank you so much um wow you know we're, we're we're going at some huge questions here aren't we and funnily enough paula actually i want to pick up on one one word that you said just there which is new and it's interesting even thinking about the immersive space that we're in now people always think to the new people always think to the, the future. And, and even when I think about the immersive spaces and some of the better immersive experiences I've seen, I've engaged with, they're always sort of envisaging or imagining a future. And, and they're thinking about the new. And often that is with an absence, often even of the present, let alone thinking of the past. So um, for myself, just, just sort of working backwards and, and thinking about the tech side and thinking about, you know, I'd love to come back to the story side, but Thinking about the tech, um, I was very captivated with the possibilities of, you know, the whole immersive learning and the 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 the, the move towards um, experiential learning, which this sort of emer these emergent immersive technologies are enabling, which in my mind I saw, um, particularly having come from working in uh, feature films, and linear in the linear and flat media, I felt was a, a, literally a new format. We were we were in a new moment. When I first had my first sort of, if you like, proper VR experience, I saw a, a different way of engaging, a feeling, a new set of what, you know, um, Richard Hogarth calls structures of feeling. 
their new set of of making people feel something. What was clear to me at that was that it was very experiential. Um, and it was very physical. It was very social. Um, so, <laughs> in the midst of all of this, uh, the moment we're in now, I find myself thinking a lot about early film and early film history. Um, but if we look at the experiences of early film and the ways in which, you know, the acting was, you know, we think back to the silent films, um, the very, very early films, the ways in which audiences engaged and, and interacted with it, there were a lot of impositions of the sort of theater that was dominant at the time and the overacting in the, in the performances are there because the language and the modes of expression in terms of the storytelling weren't quite as developed. And so I find the moment we're in right now it's extremely exciting and extremely new, but also needs uh, the need for us to glance backward and to think about the past and, and not just in terms of the ethics and the principles, but I think also in terms of content uh, and in terms of the ways in which we engage with that in content and the ways in which we read that content. Um, and so, Personally, and you know, one of the things we've been doing at Heritage 5G is really actually trying to think about heritage and bring heritage, history, uh, the archive sector, bring it back and to, to find a way to re-engage um, or re, re yeah, re-engage is really the right, but not reimagine because it's, well, maybe one is always reimagining, but to re-engage with many objects and assets that are, you know, feel like they're sort of hidden away in a kind of secret archive somewhere. But, you know, I actually want to go push it even further now into the, the, the sort of the realms of history and, and the importance of history. Um, and personally, you know, and, and talking about the particulars of a, a specific projects, a number of projects we're doing around the Olympic Park. So Jim and I, as I mentioned at the beginning, sort of in touch with the projects we were doing around the Olympic Park um, in the uh, Olympic um, the area post the Olympic. And for me, what was important, I had previously in around 2012 made a film um, called Ill Manners, which was set in the area. But the area is interesting because it's got 15 secondary schools. And what was clear to me, young people right now, so in 2021, 20, 2019, a lot of those young people didn't know anything about the history of this area other than there was an Olympics there in 2012. And this idea that history somehow gets sort of erased, that we are actually able in the current moment to forget about history. Um, so for me, the idea of thinking about history is to bring the narrative back and to think about developing sort of approaches of revisiting um, what Alex was mentioning, the, the, the trajectory, the ways in which our actions are informed by a past moment, which affect the current, which in, informs the way we think about the, the future. But from what I was seeing, a lot of young people were actually completely oblivious <laughs> to the idea that there was any history here in, in a physical sense or in an archive sense prior to 2012. So throw out a whole bunch of stuff um, just to sort of go off the conversation, but uh, maybe I'll pause there rather than carry on the diatribe there. Anna. Yeah, you know, I'll jump Paula. in and say that that's, um, that's, that's very thought provoking and profound and actually in the education literature, there have also been findings that students in our K-12 system, they also don't understand that studying history is about them. It's not about yes. their story, that it's about learning about other people, other cultures, other wars, other events. They're, they're not understanding that this study of history is also, you know, their story. And for me, that's uh, um, hugely problematic as an educator. And I'm excited about different immersive possibilities that we might be able to work together and develop so that learners can actually learn history by being part of the story, by being part Absolutely. of the experience and then, then instead of learning from facts or um, 
facts or points from a textbook. They actually get to be part of the story, have that experience, and then retain that as a memory, as um, the memory as opposed to just learning more kind of facts that are information that if it's not part of a story, it doesn't seem to get um, rooted and linked into the brain and into cognition. Um, picking up on some of the points you made, Ben, about importance of story for learning and for history and for um, just for cognition and for understanding who and how we are in the world. Um, maybe Ben, do you want to speak a little bit more about the story and about but some of the simulation, simulation and visualization tools, like how they can um, help us in the realm of, of history education, or we're not just help, but you know, what are what are the affordances and constraints we might have? Thank you. Um, so I think, um, you know, my, my stance on, on using sort of immersive technologies of any kind is, you know, they tend to require a lot of work and done incorrectly, I think they can make a mess of things. And so my, my approach has always been to apply them to things that we're really bad at. Um, so most of the games and, and sort of immersive experiences I've ever tried to create were designed at things I, I knew that I wasn't succeeding in, in sort of a traditional approach, whether that was a lecture or uh, writing or, you know, another form of storytelling. So things like building empathy, you know, I, I struggled a lot early on to talk about smuggling or other illicit activities in history, um, which are commonplace. They're commonplace throughout, but the student response was always, you know, that I'd never do something like that. I would never behave in that kind of pattern. And it made it very hard to teach about a world in which that was normal. Uh, that was sort of a normal part of life along borders. Um, but when you put students in an experience where they, they have an opportunity to smuggle on their own and they're in a system and they're interacting with a system around them, um, you know, suddenly they make very different decisions than they imagined they would. You know, their competitive spirit kicks in and, and now they're smuggling. One person starts smuggling and everyone sees the value of it. And now everyone's smuggling. And so it's, it's an opportunity to reflect on the choices that people make when interacting with something larger than them. And so I think that's the real beauty of, of any sort of interactive environment is you have a chance to expose people, not to sort of the boring pieces of history, you know, how many stones were in a cathedral or the layout or things like that, you know, that's, that's ephemeral, ephemeral. But if you can show them the systems that made that history real, the systems that made the history come alive, I think suddenly they can remember the sort of experience they had on a much more visceral level. And I think they become much more empathetic in some of these higher level skills that are often very hard to learn. Uh, in a very quick and sort of concise um, manner. And so I think that's the real beauty of, of this kind of approach, or can be. Yeah, and I, I think in, the, in your answer, and we're getting some emojis there, that was a, a really powerful, um, powerful and, and thought-provoking answer. And I, I think it links to what Alex was saying also, in terms of situating our thinking within a longer narrative, so, so it's not just like right here, right now, it really is thinking, you know, with the past and past, not necessarily being a future, like a future, a projection of the future, but being able just to have that more longitudinal kind of thinking, which again, is also really hard to um, teach in this technological world where where things move fast and quick and um, and I think building on what Atif said that some history is just you know it's it's landscaped over and a new story comes mm. and and we're not doing justice to um, to to all the narratives that that are there. Um, I'm wondering if, if anyone on the panel wants, Alex, do you want to speak a yeah. bit more? I see. Sure. Okay. I'm, I mean, one of the things I think that what Ben's comments speaks to is the importance of imagination. That actually what this process does is it activates people's imagination where they can see, they can put themselves into a context in which certain actions make sense, right? Which is, I think, really important. And 
I, it, it's kind of weird that academic historians seem to be so critical of forms of history that involve the imagination, but we all use the imagination all the time, right? Because historical records are always incomplete. They're sometimes conflicting. So we're always doing imaginative leaps. And I think what's so clever about the immersive experience is it gets students to become historians and to take those imaginative leaps by literally putting themselves in that immersive experience. So they're being historians in a far more self-conscious, self-aware way than many of the academic uh, professors. So I think that role of imagination is something maybe we could talk about a bit more as being really important to historical thinking. I mean, I, I'd love to pile into this because, I mean, I've spent 20, 20 years working, you know, in the creative sector and thinking about imagination. And I mean, you know, I, I did a PhD in sociology and left sociology because I was very despondent with the sort of sense of authority of truth and, and the sense of the kind of ways in which you had a kind of type of truth and, and modes of uh, authority within academia that yeah, certain people absolutely. knew the truth and yeah. others were. <laughs> You know, and I think we're, and, and, and it was, you know, to me at the time, it was a departmental thing. If you weren't a part of the right department and didn't have the right approach or thinking, you were put aside, you know, in a way, or it, it dismissed, whatever it might be. Anyways, um, concurrent with that, I, I stepped into the creative space and got really excited about film as someone who hadn't really had a background in film and really engaged with the ways in which film at the time, so this is 90s, late 90s, early 2000s, was a way in which people could feel and empathize, see other narratives and stories, whatever they might be, and imagine situations, but, you know, as a tool for change. And I think about the movement right now um, is the possibility of actually people being able to step back into history. You know, we have the we have the possibility in a way in which I used to think about with films where we were able to, you know, a window into a world. A great documentary for me would often be something which would give you a window into a world. But we've now become so cine literate that everybody can actually read and knows the style of documentary filmmaking. They might know a whole trajectory of who that documentary filmmaker is, the approach, the camera work, the composition, and they will read those films not necessarily with the same window. And here, I think the immersive technologies provide us an opportunity to reimagine and step back into time and engage with audiences. You know, here I'd, I'd go across the board in a way. Um, um, really exciting. Um, and but we still need the tools. You know, we need the the conceptual tools, the methodological tools to help us. Because actually, the real danger out of those the real danger out of that stepping back into history is that it's all Assassin's Creed. It's all basically we are yet again consumers of a kind of painted history, um, often a kind of Hollywoodized or corporate, you know, a, of a very particular vision of a unified approach. Um, so, I mean, I think the creative side of things and the level of engagement and that sense of being able to step back um, and, and step back into history and experience it. I think it's incredibly, really, really powerful and exciting moment um, on that front. That's exciting such a good moment. Point. <laughs> Go ahead, Alex. No, I was just saying it's a really important point you made right at the start there about authority. And I think what this does is, is restore a sense of kind of historical agency um, to the people yeah. of the time, the historical figures, but also to the students themselves who become makers of history. I think that's Absolutely. a really important point. Um, and I think you just learn more when you've got, you get to play, <laughs> you know, in that kind of very, in that immersive way, you get a sense of the agency to make your own history. And that kind of connects a bit to the point about um, the kids from Stratford so thinking that they can't make history, yep. that history is something that exists outside there. But actually what you're trying exactly. to do is just restore a sense of agency. And maybe it's these environments that can really do that for them in a way that visiting an archive or a museum perhaps doesn't still. I'll just jump in yeah, really quickly I, I, and say that. I, I Jim, you say might also American have an, a, a crit critique to Assassin's Creed. So let, let's hear. Oh, 
no doubt. Yeah, the, the American Historical Review, which is the preeminent journal uh, on our side of the Atlantic in, in history, has started publishing some reviews of video games uh, in this month's issue. And this maybe surprising thing is that the review of Assassin's Creed 3, which is the episode that takes place in the American Revolution, is actually incredibly positive. Uh, it, it, it's a, a game that probably does better than many of the films and other forms of historical fiction that have existed in that moment in time. And it's compared to the HBO uh, on Adams uh, miniseries, which is also considered one of the best historical fictions of that moment in history. So that, that's really interesting. But in a separate essay, uh, another historian reflects Video games do some things incredibly well. They do the uh, the macro kind of big picture uh, pretty well, and the micro, all the tiny details of dress and buildings and Renaissance Florence or, or uh, Nazi Germany really well. Uh, but they don't do what uh, academic historians do, which is ask the big questions of why did it occur and why is it significant, and so. You know, to a certain extent, I am inspired by Assassin's Creed in the idea that you can step back into history. I'm not a big gamer, and I only played the first two versions before I had kids. Um, so I'm sure it's developed since then. But even uh, 10 years ago, Assassin's Creed did an excellent job of, of uh, bringing the landscape of uh, Florence, uh, Renaissance Florence, back to life. And I've always had this idea that, you know, what else could we do with that uh, game engine world that is so powerfully deployed there? But most of the other examples I've seen have been a bit underwhelming in that they just sort of, uh, you know, in a more academic purpose, they just create Rome in the year 300 or something that don't give you any action or events or uh, gameplay. Uh, it's just sort of architectural history at that point. So. I, I think the, the potential is that Tief has been uh, suggesting is just so immense in this moment. As this technology has become more and more accessible, uh, you can do, I think, pretty interesting things uh, with these game engines uh, without a massive corporation behind you uh, to start creating some experiences where we can add in our own games that push the kind of empathy that Ben was talking about, or we're trying to think of games that would get people to think about globalization not being something that started at the end of the 20th century, but something that has a history, a very deep history, a history where globalization was uh, essential to the growth of London in the 19th century. You just couldn't have a city on that scale without resources coming in from all over the world. So how can we uh, step back into time and get people to explore East End of London, but also come to recognize that London was being built with trees from the Ottawa Valley in Canada, and people were eating food that was grown here in Saskatchewan uh, and many other places in the world in the 1890s. Uh, can get can that kind of knowledge to a kind of exploratory uh, game-driven experience get people to think more about where do the resources that build London today uh, what are the environmental constraints on economic growth today and in the future? London was able to escape in the 1890s, but that we probably can't continue escaping for another 100 years into the future. So I'm hearing from our panel and we're talking about story and empathy and thinking with history and exploring immersive technologies for teaching concepts that are incredibly important, but really challenging to teach. So like Jim was just saying, if, if we want to learn about the limits of the Earth's carrying capacity, Studying globalization is, um, is important. It's important to look to the past to see the trajectory into the future and, and to learn lessons that um, 
learn from real real world experiences that we've already had. So I see we're at about 15 minutes left in our talk and we do want to have some time for our guests to share some of your stories or to ask questions. So I, I will let the um, panel give kind of like a last final word and be thinking if you have any questions or stories, I'll invite you to share those in just a moment. But from our panel, any other final thoughts you want to share? I, I just pile in and say one thing, which is um, as much as things are so exciting right now, um, there's always this risk. And I think we've all experienced this, that things don't work and things take time and people <laughs> then dismiss the technology completely and the ideas, um, you know, and I think we have to be patient, but I think we have to try, you know, I think now is really the moment, the, the means of, uh, the, the means of production are within our hands to, to really create, you know, and really, as I said in other conversations with people, literally grab the archives and get them out of those dusty halls or dusty storage cabinets and, and get them out into the world for people to embrace. And, and, and really, Paul, I want to come back to that sense of making it a part of my history or our history, that history is not something out there, Alex, and as, as everybody's been, it's actually something that's mine. And, you know, um, thinking about London, the history of London, the history of London is, London is also a history, it's my history as as a Canadian or my own taking on that understanding and the, the, the those sort of conflicts that have happened in the past that are happening the conflicts that are happening now have happened in the past and we can look back at the, the, the decisions yesterday you know the good and bad that were taken but that I'm a part of that trajectory but let's have a little bit of patience with the technology that's what I would say and that's going to be my last thing <laughs> Wait, sorry Those are great points, great points. I think right now I'm the poster child for patience as someone whose battery died just as we were getting into the meat of the conversation. So uh, I think that even those of us who are you know, supposedly in the know and on a panel and are working in this area, we have the same uh, challenges. Absolutely. And I think if we are going to be leaders, we're gonna have to say this This is gonna happen on occasion and, and, and we believe in what's happening. Uh, and we'll just stick to it and battle through it. And so, uh, yeah, like here we are trying to show the world. And then it's like, oh, by the way, you've got no headset power left. <laughs> that happens all the time when we're yeah. trying to be creative in, in our instruction and bring these these uh, maybe old messages in new ways to people who are studying history. And if we're not taking those risks, then as you say the, the material is going to remain in dusty boxes or in someone's memories and, and not released so that we can use them and, and effectively learn and, and grow as, as not just students, but as people. Well put. Well put. Well put in timely. I guess maybe if I can come in here um, to move away from the technology and towards the history, which is to think about how we make the histories that we make, the histories we explore, um, tackle the hard stuff. Um, we're in an environment now where acknowledging the ways in which Britain has and continues to benefit from the legacies of slavery, for example, um, from its colonial past is being made, is being, um, I don't know even know what the phrase would be to be diplomatic about this, but it is becoming, you know, it's subject to huge political pressure. And I suppose, you know, how do we immerse students in Stratford or in Bradford or in Bristol with those histories in an immersive way that is also inclusive? Um, so I, I think it's a real challenge. I think it's one thing to, to, to do the cozy stuff, but it's another thing to do the hard stuff. And I suppose, how do we do this well? And how do we, yeah, how do we do it well? That is ethically and and inclusive way, and not shying away from the stuff that the government clearly wants us to shy away from it. Mm. How do we do it well and with inclusive perspectives? 
Jim, let's hear from you. The, the internet is littered with badly made games by academic historians <laughs> uh, built in Flash or some equivalent technology uh, where they got some sizable funding grant from uh, from the research councils to just build something that you ask students to play uh, for a course and they just laugh at you because the day it was released, it was about six years, seven years behind technology. So I think we're going to have to really be thoughtful about how to do this well. And it's not going to be by marshalling the resources that the corporate game producers have to do something on the scale of Assassin's Creed. And very recently, Atif and I have been talking about the importance of audio uh, because we can make pretty impressive kind of visualizations pretty cheaply, uh, recreating a 3D model of a factory in the 19th century. But I think there's a lot to be learned from the podcast world as well, uh, because if you can do really engaging audio that is matched to this fairly simple and cheap piece of emerge, uh, immersive uh, AR, then you're taking two things that aren't super resource costly to create. Uh, people are making all kinds of great podcasts on shoestring budgets. Uh, and you, we can bring those together to create an experience uh, where, where you can do very powerful learning, where we don't need the resources of the, the state, and we don't need to create a bad version of Assassin's Creed that takes away all the fun <laughs> murder and mayhem and replaces it with uh, uh, boring pedagogy. You know, so I, I think we're we're actually in the in the project we're just launching, going to spend the the summer kind of looking at what has worked and I think that's going to be a relatively short list but also at, at what hasn't worked in a, a broad array of you know online exhibits games uh, different kinds of immersive products out there and, and and try and identify what not to do as much as is what to do and then try and, and not be constrained by what has been done in the same way that the first nature film producers, didn't try to recreate the Natural History Museum with the stuffed dead animals in front of the painted uh, backdrops. You know, they were able to do something very new in that moment. But what is that new thing we can do now in 2021? It avoids just trying to recreate the physical museum, uh, but in a less social, less uh, fun way than just actually going to the Canadian Museum of History. We already have that. Um, how do we? do something better that really captures the strengths of immersives. Good point. Excellent wrap up thoughts. Ben, do you have any last final comments? No, Jim, I think Jim summarized uh, most of what I think the sort of potential and, and, and challenges are around uh, around this. So to our audience, does anybody have any questions or stories to share about um, how your experiences learning the history or any AR, VR examples of, um, of historical experiences that meant anything to you? We'd love to hear from you if anyone has questions. Um, you can, you can Use the um, raise hand button. Be quiet. Got a quiet audience. <laughs> Everyone's just Such a um, beautiful sunny well, day. I mean, can you blame? <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful sunny day in Central Park, <laughs> New York, no doubt. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we've got. Um, okay, hang on. Okay, we've got St. Justin with the question. And let me give you, amplify your voice here. It's done, Paula. Okay, perfect. Okay, St. Justin, what's your question? Peter, how are you? You're great. Thanks for asking us a question. 
So um, not really so much of a question, but just uh, um, an interesting uh, part of history. So there's a book called uh, uh, Nostromo. It's a tale of uh, um, a seaboard. And what they did is uh, the actual uh, people that did the movie Alien uh, took that book and they made it, they re, you know, visioned that concept and put it into space, put it into a completely different environment. Um, and I found that actually kind of interesting that they took an old book, has absolutely nothing to do with aliens, nothing to do with space, nothing to do with anything. It is literally just about the sea. And then they transferred that to something completely different. And so my thought process was, what if we took a book and kind of did that in virtual reality? What if we took an idea or a book and kind of played around with that concept and made an environment that sort of matched, you know, the chapters of a particular book? I'm sorry, I, I'm not able to hear what you're saying there. Chief, you need to amplify your voice. So sorry. And host tools. Um, there we go. Sorry, I was just going to say, I mean, uh, I think that uh, we, we, we find, uh, I mean, uh, in the story world, and, you know, when it comes to feature films, this is something that's often done quite a bit in terms of people find stories and will reimagine, re-envision them. I mean, as an example, I'm working on a, a Dr. Faustus story, a retelling mm. of Dr. Faustus set in Saudi Arabia, yeah. you know, it's meant to be a very political thing, specifically around the assassination of Khashoggi. Um, now, oh, wow. that, you know, you could say, well, what's the connection? There's, and, you know, sometimes the connection can be more overt and less overt. And I think it comes back to, to the, the ideas of story. You know, at the core of story, you've got a beginning, you've got a middle and an end. That's what mm -hmm. it is. And this is what makes it very primal. And, and in a way, the setting and the characters and the journeys are things that you can map and you can borrow from historical stories. But what's interesting about the immersive space right now is the ability to, to feel them. You know, again, going back to good old Richard Hogarth's ideas of structures of feeling, if, if, if our culture, our cultural works are sets of, you know, these sort of embodied sort of collection of feelings that we make a, um, a, a viewer or an audience member feel, with immersive, we have this opportunity to really, you know, step into this sort of e empathy space and really allow people to, to experience something in a spatial way rather than in a, a distanced way. And this is what makes it really exciting. So in that sense, it's about actually being on the ship, you know, of Nostromo and actually going on that journey. And that is the, you know, imagine alien where you're on the ship. Um, you know, with Ridley or, or the gang, but that is where the difference lies, that ability to actually be there rather mm -hmm. than having that sense of distance. Um, and, but, uh, and, and in that sense, thinking about history, although there is a lot of opportunity for reimagining historical content, I think there are great stories that, that are, are already there. There are great paintings and stories and narratives and, histories that are i think with immersive technologies has sort of been rubbed away we're all sort of imagining you know ready player one and ready to mm -hmm. imagine the future and not really thinking about past um then yeah. from that yeah that's the, my little two cents on that mm -hmm. it's really cool i have a i have a private event that i uh, was uh, I'm trying to develop, and it's it's not for quite some time from now, but one of the ideas was uh, throughout the event, hire people that are sort of actors in the event to facilitate, you know, movement and facilitate different things, but each one of the actors actually plays a role in the event, and it kind of pushes the event through, but it actually draws upon actual historical writings um i just thought that would be a really cool you know hook to kind of draw people in through the event
Thanks for asking that great question. And I will just add, I had a student who built Shakespeare's Globe Theater here in Alt Space. And that's basically all that he did. And the rest is up to his students. So they will use the space to, um, to do some scenes and to try to bring Shakespeare to life. And so the students can be part of the story. It's just another example of that the the technology doesn't necessarily have to be that complex to actually be effective. And we have a lot, a lot of great stories. So thanks for um, just mentioning how we can use previous stories and texts and bring them to life in different ways. I think we are almost at two o'clock. We just we're just turning right now. So thanks for sticking with our panel. And it's it's. Um, great to have this conversation with you the event will uh shortly it will the recording will stop and then we'll stick around if you have any questions or want to chat we'd love to chat with you some more there's some costumes you can put on you can also go in that horse and carriage you can actually jump right on top of it or, or go inside of it and uh thank you so much for being our guest today and Donna, you can wrap things up. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Bringing history to life. How absolutely exciting. Thank you, thank you. You guys, let's give it up. Um, give up some love for these guys. This was awesome. So just as a close, I just want to um, just take an extra moment just to um, complete the list of thank yous and acknowledgements of our sponsors, etc. So I'd mentioned HP. Their um, virtual reality and HP higher education. I'd mentioned Engage VR and Avantis Education, and we're so grateful that they found um, this um, Universal Experiences 30 Days of Value to support it. We also have stellar sponsors that I want to mention. Grove XR is an educational learning platform. You'll find it at grove.us. Dr. Angelina Dayton, we know her as the VR lady, and you guys, she does the most amazing programming with students. She's the founder of Students in VR. And so please watch for her event. She's going to be, um, there's going to be more through the summer. Frame VR, a web XR browser based social um, educational platform. You'll find it at framevr.io. Learn Bright, Bright spelled B R I T E, learnbright.com. Please check them out. Another educational platform, LBX Immersive, Waking Dream XR. So many, um, we're just so grateful for every sponsor. My name is Donna McTee. Um, for a long time, I've been in alt space for three years, and for a long time, I've used the phrase "Let's meet in VR." And so, I just decided to um, do some <laughs> some events under there, and it's been a pleasure working with um, behind the scenes and with the speakers and and uh, and prepping rooms and all that sort of thing that happens behind the scenes. And it's been a pleasure doing that for this um, conference. And last, but certainly not least are um, Tony Cube Studios, who is working with filming. We have volunteer filmers that are memorializing these different sessions. So you can rewatch and catch what you missed the first time, right? Or you'll be able to catch sessions that you weren't able to catch. There's so many, we've got over 170 events. And so I know you missed some, I certainly did. And so we'll, uh, you will be able to catch with the videos. And our, it, there's always moderators in the room and, and we are um, grateful to them as well. So thank you everyone. We are now going to pause and end recording. Thank you everyone for coming. Educational World Tour with Laurel is up next. You guys don't want to miss that. And there's more excellent events um, happening in Allspace and in Engage today. So please check the calendar. Thank you everyone. <laughs>